Cleveland Park, it's a community of people. And that was intended from the very beginning by the developer. I moved to Cleveland Park because I have family here. I think I was trying to really recreate my own childhood, actually. I wanted to be able to be in a neighborhood where my kids could walk to school, we have an alley where my kids could learn to ride their bike. I moved to this neighborhood in 1973, uh, falling in love with the houses and the trees and just the whole neighborhood because it seemed so much like the place where I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts. People talked about the importance of uh, convenience to little shops along Connecticut Avenue and Wisconsin Avenue and the personal relationships that they have with the shopkeepers. The people in this neighborhood are all young, old, they have all type of people in here uh, and they all uh, are very good customer for us. I know a lot of my customers. I know them, I know their mothers, I know their daughters, you know, it's, it's great. One of the best things about Cleveland Park, and it's not a cliche to say, it's a small town in the city. I am Cleveland Park, an urban village in the heights of Washington, D.C. Admired for my beauty, my convenience, my feeling of community. But I wonder, In a world where cities are overrun by traffic and commercial development, can I survive? Centuries ago, I was thousands of acres of rolling farmland. My name back in the 1740s, Pretty Prospect. My first known resident was Colonel Uriah Forrest, Revolutionary War hero and friend of George Washington. Eager to move his family out of the sweltering urban center of Georgetown, Colonel Forrest bought 420 acres in the high green hills of Pretty Prospect in 1793. He named his property Rosedale, and built a gracious home on the foundation of an old stone cottage. I'm pleased to note that Colonel Forrest was also my first commuter, riding to his office in Georgetown along the old Frederick Road, today's Wisconsin Avenue. During the 1800s, I welcomed other prominent Washingtonians who also wanted estates and summer homes in my cool green hills above the city. Gardner Green Hubbard, founder of the National Geographic Society, built Twin Oaks, modeling it after a home he had known in his native New England. And in 1865, Colonel Forrest's grandson built Forest Hill. It was, he said, a roomy dwelling on a hill, looking upon nothing but beauty and breathing nothing but health. Which is why, perhaps, in 1886, President Grover Cleveland bought it for his new bride. When Cleveland lost his bid for a second term, he sold the house, and later it was torn down. So much for historic preservation. By the 1890s, the new electric streetcars made it possible to imagine commuter suburbs north of the city limits. But there were obstacles, until a wealthy developer built bridges over the yawning Rock Creek and Klingo Gaps and a road that could carry electric streetcars to his new suburb in Chevy Chase, Maryland. It was then I became a stop on a streetcar line and Cleveland Park was born. Why the name? President Cleveland was gone, but the PR opportunity for the developers must have been irresistible. I'm happy to say that my creator, John Sherman, was a speculator with a vision. 
He imagined a suburb with a soul. Sherman and his partner hired prominent architects to design a community of homes with welcoming porches and elegant Victorian detail set back from tree-shaded streets. Beautiful homes and what Sherman called amenities. Park your horse at the stable and wait for the streetcar at the nearby Community Lodge. In 1903, the Washington Times hailed me Queen of the Suburbs, a cool and pleasant resort where the breeze from the hills makes life one grand sweet song. By 1916, I had more than 150 houses, a fine public school, a congregational church, the beginnings of a national cathedral, and a state-of-the-art firehouse. It was the upbeat 1920s. Developers filled out my edges lining Connecticut Avenue with apartment houses and with shops. The John Eaton School expanded and a neighbor donated a house and pool for the Cleveland Park Club where families could gather and children could learn to swim. One of my residents remembers the days of her childhood. Well, when it snowed, we could go sledding from morning until night. Well, at 36th Street was the top, and that's where the big Irish policeman was. And he had a big bonfire going, and we would walk up to the top of the hill and get on these sleds, and we'd go 60 miles an hour going down the street. In the late 20s, I was confident. I thought nothing bad could ever happen. How quickly things can change. The Great Depression of the 1930s hit Washington hard. Some people couldn't afford to keep my big houses. Some couldn't afford to heat them. Bankers who had once pushed loans for Cleveland Park houses now refused mortgages. I was considered a blighted neighborhood. Yet in the midst of the misery, I got something very special on Connecticut Avenue, the elegant Art Deco Uptown Theater. In hard times, perhaps because of the hard times, it seemed there was always 25 cents for a movie. In the 1940s, thousands of new workers flocked to Washington, and they all needed a place to live. My old homes were divided up to meet the new housing demand. And McLean Gardens, a moderately priced rental apartment community, was built on 44 acres of one of the greatest states. Things were looking up. In the 1950s, uh, the neighborhood uh, was, I think, kind of a sleepy place. Uh, it had wonderful big houses, but I imagine some of them were sort of run down, needed some loving care. Uh, and my understanding is that young lawyers and uh, um, perhaps some academics uh, coming to town found these big houses very affordable. 
Um, they had a lot of bedrooms. They were good for families. And so that change began to happen, I think, in the late 50s. Um, and then in the early 60s, uh, the Kennedy administration people discovered the neighborhood. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The people who now poured into the neighborhood were lawyers and journalists, people perhaps who had just come to Washington. Uh, many of them had young families, young children, and uh, they found this neighborhood wonderful as well. Thank goodness. The queen of the suburbs was making a comeback. Once again, I thought nothing bad could ever happen to me. Uh-oh. I was about to be buried in concrete by high-speed automobiles until a few of my neighbors refused to let me get run over. Around 1956, uh, Congress passed the Interstate Highway Act. Throughout the country, the, there was a, a developing a strong highway lobby of road builders, unions, automobile manufacturers, to remove the last vestiges of a rapid transit service and substitute auto and bus service. And there was a lot of emphasis on planning a greater Washington that would expand into the suburbs that would all be connected with these new interstate freeways. And it was a radio going northwest through Cleveland Park that was the top priority to the DC Highway Department. This neighborhood would be choked with traffic trying to get on and off the freeway. It would have destroyed the fabric of the community. This freeway proposal was in the, uh, the Washington Star, I think it was about August of 1959. And I read it and was quite disturbed about it. And a few days later, David Sanders Clark came to my door and said, would I be interested in joining his group to fight this freeway? And I said, sure, I would. I did a lot of research, and that was the hard part of it, to develop rational arguments against the freeways and for rapid transit. I probably spoke to 40 or 50 different civic organizations throughout the city. The tools that were used were everything that we could get our hands on, this including lobbying Congress, including lobbying the White House. The battle didn't really end until 1973 or so, when Congress amended the federal aid highway legislation to authorize cities to transfer federal aid from freeways to rapid transit. I think it was Lewis Mumford who said, uh, forget the damn highways, plan your cities for friends and lovers. Once the freeway battle had been won, I thought I could relax. Families were renovating my old houses and building new ones on my vacant lots, including a residence designed by the renowned architect I.M. Pei. But along my western edge, along that old Frederick Road, developers were poised for an attack. In the summer of 1970, the Post ran a picture and an article about a planned redevelopment for the McLean Gardens project. There was this shock when we saw these, all these tall buildings, of many Manhattan, literally. We got a description of what would have been put on the 44 acres, that is, McLean Gardens. There was a hotel, a hospital, a shopping center, apartment towers. But it was major, major redevelopment of what was three-story residential buildings. The impact would have been enormous. The increase in traffic from that scale of development would have created pollution, 
noise, and the necessity to widen the streets through the neighborhood. And McLean Gardens was part of us. They were part of our neighborhood. So having that changed into a Manhattan, a, a kind of cold tower place, was simply out of the question. In order for the developers to proceed with the plan, they had to have the property rezoned. So in order to prevent this zoning change, we began to organize the community. And that meant organizing every single block in Cleveland Park with a block captain. We then published a newsletter and delivered it to those block captains, notifying them of any zoning hearing. We would go in two or three school buses, so that when we got to the zoning hearing, all these people pouring into the district building, where all the elected officials were, they saw these crowds. Believe me, the news media paid attention and the elected officials started to pay attention that this wasn't just a done deal, forget about it. That was the strategy, and keeping it very visible. Some of the ways we created and maintained public pressure were to have rallies. And this was particularly at the gardens themselves, because these were the people most vulnerable. They would lose their homes if this rezoning went through. And that was also the most politically savvy place to place your time, because politicians are not known for standing up and putting you out of your house. Well, after this long period of hearing after hearing, changes of ownership, changes of rooms, night meetings, day meetings, we won. They turned down the application. It was almost anticlimactic. It was like, we won? You know, people really, we won. End of story. In 1985, Washington had its long-awaited metro rail system, and I had my own station. A commuter's dream, and you guessed it, a developer's dream as well. The wrecking crew prepared to strike. The thing that galvanized us the most was this plan to build an 11-story mixed-use, that's office, retail residential tower right at the Cleveland Park Metro where the park and shop is now. And we thought to ourselves, what can stop it? Well, we thought a historic district could stop it. We knew a historic district could stop it, but we knew that getting a historic district approved was a very long-term process. So the only thing that we could think of that would put the brakes on this particular demolition of this little shopping center was to file a historic landmark on this building, this little 1929 building. If it was a landmark, then you couldn't tear it down. If it wasn't a landmark, you'd go ahead. Now, everybody looked at that uh, uh, park and shop. It was an old building. It had fallen apart. They would kicked the tenants out. It looked miserable. It was down at the heels. There was trash all over. Somehow that little building spoke to me. I remember older people saying, oh, the park and shop, that's the oldest shopping center on the East Coast. And if, if it was, there had to be some documentation. So I went down to Martin Luther King Library and I went through reel after reel after reel of microfilm. And I'd almost given up and bingo, there it was. So we had the documentation cold. What was interesting about the park and shop, it was a new concept. And it's the grandmother of all the shopping centers. So I ran down to that building and I got out a sketch pad. I'm not an artist. I drew a picture of the building as it is and I drew a picture of what I had been shown with, by the developer as a possible replacement building. And I put, do you want this or this on the flyer? And I hand walked that flyer around to every house in the neighborhood and all the apartment buildings. We didn't know what to expect when we uh, went down the Historic Preservation Review Board to hear the landmark application on the parking shop. And we had, I'd say, 40, 50, 60 people down there. And when the developers saw how many people we had there, they realizing that the Historic Preservation Review Board was pretty political too, these guys would see how much support we had in the neighborhood. And I really do think that that was maybe the single most important factor which scared the developers off. And that's when they agreed to settle and uh, not hear the landmark application but roll everything into a later hearing on the historic district nomination. 
then we could go back to the work of researching every individual house, all of the estates, and put together a proposal to declare a Cleveland Park Historic District. And my role in all of this was to do the history and do the education, write the landmarks, stand up in front of all these boards and defend them, and go around block by block in the neighborhood and give my lecture about the history so that everyone understood what we were doing, including the merchants. The only people that really opposed us uh, were the merchants, uh, and, and a number of the merchants. They were organized by one merchant. Merchant, especially those who owned their buildings, felt that because they only had one-story buildings, that if they were in a historic district, that they would be forever limited to what they could develop. Despite the opposition, the neighborhood made its case to the powers that be and won. Having a historic district which included not only the residential areas, but the commercial areas, meant that for the first time, the neighborhood would have protection against a large development projects. And that probably more than anything else is what has protected and preserved Cleveland Park up until this day. Community, community, community. That's what I'm all about. Sadly, my green space has steadily shrunk and what remains has been threatened. Take Tregaron, for example. Tregaron Estate is located in Cleveland Park. It's uh, 20 plus acres and it was a beautiful country estate built in 1912. It's like an enchanted forest over there and it goes in and out of meadows to woodlands to streams to gardens and it's a beautiful place. Six acres were bought by an independent school. The remaining 14 acres were purchased by a developer who had big designs to fill it up with many houses, make a lot of money, put roads, community up there, just fill up pretty much every inch of the 14 acres. The only protection that the neighborhood had to stop these was to point out that the site, Tregaron Estate, was a DC landmark prior to the developer purchasing the site. That was in 1979. And then in 1986, the whole neighborhood became a, a historical district. So that combined uh, was really what we used always whenever diff various different development proposals would come forward. If it went down to the Historic Preservation Review Board, we'd get neighbors down there, filed letters, uh, filed affidavits, submitted our own briefs. We could pack rooms, but we also supported it with legal standings and all the protections that we felt the site had. After years of being very contentious and fighting, they all realized that this was they were not going to get to build all these houses and they were not going to get to make a bunch of money. And if anything, they were going to lose money. They are going to deed over 13 out of 14 acres that are privately owned. And that land will never, ever be developed. It's going into the Tregaron Conservancy. We, the Tregaron Conservancy, a new nonprofit organization, will own the land for perpetuity. And it will be a legacy that not just me, but the whole Cleveland Park uh, community well, it has given, I think, to the nation, to the world. So, once again, little David slays the developer dragon. But wait, can the dragon become the hero of the story? Remember Rosedale, where my story began in the 1700s? Well, the Rosedale greens shrank over the centuries from thousands of acres to seven. Occupied by families, then by a boarding school, then by a student exchange group. And through all the years, the neighborhood was allowed to use the lawns as a village green. But suddenly, the village green was about to vanish. Youth for Understanding put the property up for sale and a school bid an exorbitant $12 million. We were all in a state of shock. The threat to the neighborhood was that this part of Cleveland Park would literally be sort of split asunder by a big active institution. We did have one important 
trick up our sleeve, and that was that the neighborhood secured a promise from Youth for Understanding that we would have a right of first refusal in the event they ever sold the property. And what that meant was that if within 90 days from the school's offer of $12 million, we could match the $12 million contract dollar for dollar, that we would be able to purchase the property. $12 million in 90 days? Six weeks of frantic fundraising produced only a fraction of that sum. I remember it as being sometime in mid-July or so, uh, or even late July, we came to realize that we just were not able to put together enough money and, you know, everyone was um, dejected. My beautiful Rosedale was lost, unless we could find a partner. There's a fellow who uh, lived right down the street uh, who was an architect and sometimes developer and he brought in uh, a developer who in a very significant way saved the day uh, who was prepared to uh, buy a big significant part of the north part of the property uh, on the concept that he would sell the property to various people who would build houses up here and we would in that way be able to generate more money. It was just night and day work. Uh, not only on the fundraising side, but also now putting together agreements among all of the players. There were so many naysayers along the way who said you can't raise money this way, it can't be done. It was a, a volunteer effort almost from beginning to end. People had to work together. The neighborhood was just, I think, universally overjoyed. Uh, that we had been able to do this seemingly impossible task. Remember, only a few months earlier, uh, we were quite certain that there was no way this could possibly happen. So in a period of six weeks or two months, we had gone from utter despair to the elation of having succeeded. That was the end of one chapter, but the beginning of another very important chapter because Rosedale has been preserved as Cleveland Park's Village Green. So, I'm safe for now, deeply in debt to the people in my community who organized, worked hard, and made use of every tool they could find to preserve my past and shape my future in a constantly changing world. And so, I'm proud to say, I am Cleveland Park. 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 I am Cleveland Park.